welcome back. First, announcements. Today is your due date for the assignment two, so please do not forget to submit your assignment two. Uh, next week, Monday, we have the second exam. So Monday, next week, the second intern. Comprehensive, everything. Uh, the two new topics or the two new things beside what we uh, include in the first one is going to be loops, obviously, conditions, loops and conditions together, and the topics that we covered this week, object-oriented programming. Those are the two main topics. As usual, I plan to do a review by the end of the week. So Thursday, we have a review. And today, after you submit your assignment two, we are going to open your assignment three. As usual, you have a week to work. However, because Monday is exam, we are moving the due date to the 23. However, both the topics in the assignment two and the topics in the assignment three are included in the exam. So my recommendation, finish both assignment two by today, assignment three before the exam. That can help you to prepare for the exam. However, if for any circumstance you cannot submit, even though you review and practice, well, the due date is June 23. So put these dates in your schedule. So do not forget two assignments, one exam, and the review. Good? So moving forward. What we did in the previous weeks. We are practically at the middle of the class. You should know how to do a program right now. You are doing programming. Uh, at least the last example that I showed you in the previous week is a complete program, something that is not just examples of particular statements or examples of one instruction, but we are moving to solve problems with your knowledge of the language. Now, I want to review another example. Uh, and this is just with the knowledge that you should already have. So imagine that we asked you in a homework, in the exam, whatever, to create a piece of software, a program. A program similar to the one that you use on Canvas for your quizzes similar to the one that you use on Canvas to do your exam, for example. Uh, I would like to have this program in Java for quizzes. Now, to make things simple, I would like to have a program in Java that make quizzes, but let's use limit the questions to arithmetic skills. So I am thinking about a program that is able to ask the user questions like this, you know, two numbers, a particular operation, and give me the result. If you think about it, it's like, I need variables, maybe variables for the numbers, I need maybe a variable to store the result. If I want to ask something like this several times to the user, maybe it could be a good idea to have a loop. So the program asks these kind of questions again and again and again. Those are the elements that we reviewed before. And my goal is that you can connect those elements to this kind of problem. Always, your problems, when you try to solve something using programming, you need to translate the requirements, the needs of a particular user to variables, conditions, loops, and so on. So now, if I limit this program, just to make it quickly, uh, these numbers, uh, they are integers, but let's think about just two digits. I just want to test the arithmetic skills of my user showing these kind of operations, but I only want to show 
numbers, 0 to 99. Moreover, uh, if I want to keep this simple for you to finish in 15 minutes or less, uh, let's think about only addition. So instead of arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, I only care about addition right now. Can we create a program that show the question to the user, but moreover, grade the quiz? So the program asks the question, the program receives the answer from the user, and then the program somehow compare the answer that I give with the correct answer, and then the program is able to tell me you are right, points, or you are wrong. That is basically what is happening in your quizzes with Canva, right? Obviously, Canva is a web application. Here we are thinking about a desktop application, but it's because of the language. But the logic, the background, looks like it could be the same. Before I mentioned loops and variables, now that I am thinking about the grading and I am thinking about this, compare the correct result with the one that the user provide, basically I am introducing a condition and if else, probably. So showing the grade to the student, kind of how many questions you answer correctly and how many questions you do not answer correctly. Uh, we can do this playing with variables, right? I mean, at the end, what I do to calculate your grade or what you can do to calculate a grade is just storing values in variables and then adding things, dividing by the number of questions. I mean, arithmetic operators, right? addition, division, and maybe integer or double variables. If I ask you to do this program for a lab, for an exam, how many time do you need? What do you do? How do you start? My goal at this point is solving this should be something easy to do for you. If you're thinking, I can start right now programming this and I can finish in five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. You are moving forward with the class. I mean, everything that we have reviewed is working. If you think I have no idea how to start with this, my recommendation for this week is ask for office hours with me, with the TA, whatever. Solving something like this is kind of your test to know if you're prepared to take the second midterm exam, because this should be something that you should be able to solve. And the midterm is going to be not this kind of questions, but something similar. Good. Now, reviewing the solution. Why I mentioned 10 to 20 minutes? Well, this is the solution. Uh, something that I want to show you, and the reason because I start today with this program is, is the second big example that I show you. I show you the tic-tac-toe in the previous week. And for the tic-tac-toe, I basically put everything inside of the main. You are going to create the method later during the week. This one, something that I want to do is to be sure that you are okay with several methods. We describe this idea of programming is like doing a paper. And you can do your paper with one paragraph, like I did with my tic-tac-toe in one big main method, everything inside. Hopefully you have the opportunity to copy paste and run my program and everything works. One class, one method, the main have everything because you know that the main is the only method that the computer is going to run. Now, it's a good idea, uh, not really. Why? It's very hard to read, right? As you notice, the program compiles, the program run. For the computer, it's fine. But for you, it's not a good idea to make a program with only one method, like doing a paper with only one paragraph. Question in the chat, why not to use the method equal ignore case? Just because I want to create a 
big complex uh, condition there. That is the only reason. You can replace my condition with that method, but it's just one method and a small condition. I want to play with the operator, the relational and the logic, just to be sure that you understand what is happening there. That is the only reason. Remember, you're using a language. There are several ways to say the same. And most of the time, I am going to select the most complex uh, way, just to be sure that you understand that complex way. And then you can move to the easy way, like in this case, use, using one method. That is the only thing. Now, my solution here, different from the one that I showed you in the previous week for the tic-tac-toe. As usual, one class and mandatory. At this point, you understand this main should be there. There is no way that you create a program without the main. Moreover, as far as today, you know, public static, public static, public static, public static, public static, public static. Global variables and method, I have asked you to put this public static. We're going to review that today, tomorrow, uh, going deep in what is the meaning of those two words. But so far, you put that and your program work. Now, for the problem that I mentioned to you before, hopefully you agree with me. It's like, you know that you're going to ask the user for an answer. And you know that, well, if you're going to use my show input dialog to ask the user for the answer, that one is going to give you an answer and the answer is going to be a string. So it could be a good idea to have this variable string to store the answer. The name for the variable, whatever you want, I select answer string. The type is a string. You like you have done before several programs. And then, well, I would like to grade the quiz. And the quiz is about arithmetic questions, right? Additions. So I am thinking about, well, somehow I need to know the correct answer. And I am thinking about this variable, uh, correct answer. And my variable correct answer is the one that is going to store the correct answer that I am going to compare somehow with whatever the user gives me. So the answer from the user, the answer that I know is correct, the one that is correct is a number. <clears throat> and if I want to play with grades, maybe I can put a variable grade also in my program, right? Playing with data types. The answer that the user is going to give me is a string, as I described before. The answer that I know is the correct one is a number. Just to change the stimuli, I am using not int, but long. The only reason I want you to remember short, long, in, by, all of them, integer values. But there are more than one option. Grade, the grade of the student, your grade. Uh, let's make it double, just to be aware of the decimals. And again, 15 decimals. If I use float, seven decimals. Those are the things that you know now and you should be using in your programs whatever. I put these variables outside of the methods. Hopefully it makes sense for you that what I am doing is global variables. And because they are global variables, I am using this public static before the type. For the global variables, we need to do that so far. That is going to change. So I have three global variables here. And the only reason because I put them global is I am planning to use them in more than one method. Something that you know at this point, local variables, you only can use them inside of the method in which you put those variables. But if you want to share a variable between several methods, several paragraphs, you put the variable global and anyone can use it. So here, I am thinking like maybe these variables are going to be needed in more than one paragraph, in more than one method. I can put them global. Now, I have these three global variables. Uh, my program start with the main. I put this box here. 
using closing my main method. My quiz. I want a program that shows the user 10 questions. Just to start with something. I would like to show 10 questions. If I tell you that I need to show 10 questions or 20 questions or 100 questions, or I give you a particular number, your quiz is going to have 20 questions, 50 questions, 10, five. If I give you the number, you know that I am thinking in a loop. But moreover, if it's a loop and you know how many times that loop is going to run, that is suggesting you a for loop, remember? while the while for loop when you know how many times your option is a for loop just because it's clean it's elegant uh, a for loop in which you can have the variable inside the variable that you know is going to be the one controlling the loop uh, and you can play with that one and it's like okay i am going to start with the question one and then i am going to move forward until that condition is true. And the last number that is going to make that condition true is the 10, right? Because I am using lower or equal. So equal is included in the option that I have to make that condition true. So if you think about it, the loop is going to run with one, two, three, so on, until 10. And hopefully by now you are getting familiar with this plus plus, right? Variable equal variable plus one. So this is going to run 10 times. Now, if you remember for the tic-tac-toe, I put comments. And then I asked you to replace those comments with the real source code and make the copy paste of everything inside of the main. A second option, a better option. Instead of comments, what about calling methods? Do you remember that, right? Is a method another paragraph can be called inside of the main. In fact, it's the only way that you can tell the computer to execute a method that is not made, calling that method. How do you call the method? With the name and the parentheses. So in this case, I am thinking about, you know what? The first thing that I want to happen inside of the loop, ask a question to the user. I want to ask a question. Now, instead of having here all the source code that I need to ask a question, what I do is, at this point, my line 11 is, you know what? I need to ask a question. I am going to call a method, ask a question. And that method from here, I am going to come down and I am going to run this method ask question as you know public static void ask question the parentheses the curly brackets and all these instructions are going to be executed and when that finish i am going to go back to the next line in main remember this calling things jumping so instead of having all this here i am just organizing my program. So, ask a question. Go down. If you notice, I have local variables. Local variables, why? Well, the global, because they are going to be shared between, among several methods. But I can have also locals. I can, my program is a combination between locals and globals. It's up to me to select one or the other. Now, in this case, in order to ask a question, something that I need to do is show the user two numbers and ask the user what is the result of adding those two numbers, like I showed you before in the instructions. Something that I can do is, well, instead of having the numbers there, why not randomly select two numbers? And if you remember, we have this method in the library that give me a random number, right? We use this one in the tic-tac-toe for a different reason. So math.random. 
do you remember what is the result of math.random? What I get when I call that random in the library math? Hopefully you remember you get a number exactly, zero to one. I get a number zero to one always between those two. What I can do is multiply that number times 100. And hopefully it is clear that if I am going to get a number zero to one, when I multiply 100, well, it's going to be zero to 100, but what is the possibility of the 100? So I can be happy between zero and 99. Good. Yeah, we talk about random in the previous one with the uh, with the tic tac toe. So this instruction and these two variables n one and n two, well, they are going to have a value. Which value? Randomly zero to one hundred, one number between these two boundaries. And well, what is going to be the correct answer for my question? the addition of those numbers, just because what I am going to ask to the user is to do the addition. And what I do with the correct answer, if you notice, I store the correct answer in my variable correct answer. Uh, this one do not have a type because I am not declaring the variable. I am using this variable. Did you notice global variables? I can use the global variables anywhere in any method like this one. And by the way, I am going to use that one again here later. So two methods, both using one variable. Why? Because it's global. Now, the next thing that I need to do, well, this method is to ask a question to the user. Well, ask the question, show the user the question. And hopefully something like this makes sense to you n1 a long variable plus plus did you notice the change of color is something in green quotation mark and plus hopefully it's clear for you now that what i have there is a string and the string have the plus it's not an operator it's a character and what i am doing with this plus here is adding a number the variable n1 plus this string, green color. What is going to be the result of adding the number with the string? Hopefully you remember concatenation. What is going to happen is I am going to have the value of the number and the string together. Moreover, I am going to add another number. And moreover, I am going to add another string with the equal. If you think about it, I create two random numbers, numbers, and what I am going to print to the user in this nice dialog box is going to be the first number, the symbol plus, the second number, and the symbol equal, the characters. The user is going to show that the numbers randomly created and the plus and the equal. That's it. And because the show input dialog is going to show that is also going to show this text area in which you can write something. Remember, you have been doing that several times. And whatever you write in the dialog box, when you press OK, that string is going to be stored in the variable and where string. Now, the variable and where string is another variable that I put global just because I want to use that one in several methods. I am going to use that one here to store whatever the user put in the variable. And this finish, and I go back to the main. Did you notice? I start with that question, go down, execute all the instructions, and now I am going back. And I am going back, and I am going to found this if. And the if is using my variable and what a string. What is the value in the variable and where a string? Well, 
because always the ask question, all these things are going to be executed before the if. The value in answer string is going to be whatever the user write in the dialog box, right? So this is what the user put in the dialog box. When I go back here, I have that whatever in the variable. Now, it's a string. Because it's a string, another thing that we review in one of the lectures is if you want to compare a string with another string, you cannot use the equal equal operator. The equal equal operator is only for numbers, right? Or characters. With the strings, you need to do something different. Uh, if you remember, we reviewed this method equal. And also we reviewed this compare to. And some of you have been working with other things like the equal ignore case. So those things are for strings. In this case, just for you to remember, I am using this equal. The answer is string, the string equal. And I put three comparisons. Moreover, I use the operator or. And my goal is for you to tell me what is the meaning of that condition? What I am doing there? Hopefully it's clear that what I am trying to say to the computer is, you know what? If the user, instead of answering the question with a number, if the user put in the dialog box the word with uppercase everything or lowercase everything, or the first letter uppercase, any of those three options. And if you notice, I am using the this, or this, or that. Basically, translating what I am telling you as my requirement to programming, well, is using the operator or. And you know that if any of these conditions is true, one of them, one of the three, the full condition we come through. Remember the table that we review for the OR. Now, if any of those is true, I am going to run this instruction here. And that is another instruction that we review. Remember, continue and break. Someone asked me, when you use the break? Well, this is one example. This loop is a for loop. How many times is it going to run? 10 times according with the condition that I have there. My plan is for this to run 10 times. After 10 times, it's going to stop. However, also, if the user write quit, the quiz stop, doesn't matter how many questions the user have answered, or maybe it could be the first question, and I just put quit, and the program stop. I have that extra option, and that is because my instruction break. So 10 times, or doing something, writing something that make this condition true, and therefore stop. If you think about a menu, uh, I am comparing here strings, but you can compare numbers, and you can ask, for the zero to be equivalent to exit or something like that. Several programs do that. Or for the letter Q instead of the full width. Uh, using Q make your program easy because then you can use the equal equal operator instead of calling something like this equal. Anyway, in some point, the loop finish. And when the loop when this condition finish, and before the loop finish, the second thing that I want to do is to call another method. And again, for the tic-tac-toe, I put a comment, and I ask you to copy-paste the code there. Another option is, well, instead of a comment, I can call another method. I can call another of the paragraphs, another of the actions that I have defined in my program. In this case, grade the answer. Notice one method only to show the question, one specific action, one part of the problem. Another method 
to grade the question. It's another part of the problem, another paragraph. Easy to read, hopefully. Grade the question. Uh, there are different things that I need to do to grade, right? I mean, keep a score for the student and so on. But thinking about the easy solution for the first version of the program, I call grade and answer. This one is going to jump, and I am going to start executing this method, this paragraph. And well, what I can do? I have the answer that the user put in the box, but what I have is this string as an answer. You know that the first thing that you need to do is to translate that string to a number. In this particular case, I am using double values, right? I store the correct answer as a long value. Uh, you can use integer parsing. You can use the long. You can use, why not? A double. At the end, the user is going to put the solution. The solution should not have decimals because the two numbers do not have decimals, but use in case, right? And the only reason because I put here double is because I want to ask you, this program work with addition, but can you modify my program to ask not only for addition, but also for subtractions, maybe divisions and multiplications? So thinking about that next step, I am using doubles, and I am going to talk a little bit more about that second version, but here, I have the answer, and this is still the answer that the user give to the computer. It's a local variable, right? This answer is local to the great answer method. The only thing that I'm going to do is to compare correct answer with answer. And again, something that I need you to notice is here I am using the equal equal operator, not the dot equal. Because now I do not have a strings, I have a double and I have an integer, a long. So I am comparing a long and a double with the equal equal, and that is perfectly fine. They are numbers. The equal equal work with numbers. So it's an if condition. And at this point, you know it's an if, condition can be true or false. I have two possibilities. Only one of those two things is going to be printed according with the condition. So condition true, correct answer, and the user answer are the same. I can tell you, good, you answer correctly the question, or I can tell you wrong. This is my version one. Now, next steps for you to practice. What do you think I can do if I want this program to ask questions not only for addition, but for the four arithmetic uh, operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And again, randomly show the user an addition or a division, a subtraction or a multiplication, randomly. Can we do something like that? Show questions with random numbers, zero to 100, but also that the operation is something random? not only additions, not only multiplication, but randomly something. Number one, if I want to do that, which method is the one that I need to work on? Hopefully, you agree like, ah, you want to change the questions? Go and work in the method ask question. You do not need to modify the main, you do not need to modify the grade. If the only thing that you want to do is to change the questions, go to that particular paragraph. This is very powerful. It's like when you are reading or writing a paper, it's when you have one particular part of the problem in one particular paragraph, in this case, in one particular method, that helps you to focus in that particular part of the full document. So here, I am not going to do the program. I want you to practice, but in that method of question here, I need randomly to select addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. Uh, what do you think about using 
Mado random to create a number one, two, three, or four, and make this one, two, three, or four equivalent to a plus minus multiplication or division. Can we use a switch for that? Can you imagine adding to the source code that I'm showing you a line between 23 and 24 in which you ask for another random number and somehow you make that random number to be between one and four and then you use that random number as the variable in a switch case statement and then you define a case one, case two, case three, case four, and each of those correspond to a particular operator. And then you do this, calculate the correct answer, and also show the question depending of case one using the plus, case two using the minus, case three using multiplication, case four using division. Well, one idea is like, and we're in the chat, uh, you know that the numbers in math random is zero to one. So what happened if you multiply that number times three? You're going to have zero to three. And what happened if we do one plus math dot random multiplication three? Okay, I like it. And if we add the floor, better again. So that is the kind of things that programming is about. It's not about the complexity of the language. It's creativity. You have these tools, and you need to solve a particular problem. How do you use your tools to solve the problem? And well, you just give me the idea with, I need a random number. Now it's between one and four. Well, multiply for something, add something. And why not? The floor is better. Or do you remember the solution that I showed you for the tic-tac-toe? In the tic-tac-toe, I need random number zero, one, or two, the columns. And the same idea with the rows, zero, one, or two, or one, two, three. Do you remember my conditions? Zero, two, point, three, three. 0.3 to 0 0.66, 0 0.66, 0 0.99. Several solutions. Obviously, this one with the floor, random, and multiplication is more elegant. But you can use the if that I give you with the tic-tac-toe. At the end, you get to the solutions. There are going to be different solutions. Some solutions are more elegant than others. And I am using the word elegant because saying better or worse is not exactly the things to say here. It's not like your paper is better than the other paper, but maybe your paper is more interesting or the reader get uh, into the continue reading your paper because the readability is better. I don't know. That is programming, creativity. And that creativity is going to make you different from another programmer, even though both can solve the problem. Now you get the idea. Random, switch, and we can start asking questions about more than just additions. Moreover, you notice that I have this grade there. I didn't show you a grade for my user. Could it be possible to have a grade for my user? It's like I am going to ask you 10 questions. Can I tell you at the end that your grade is 100? or 50, assuming that 50 is because you solved correctly five or 10 questions. Can I keep a score for the students doing this somehow? And if I can, in which place? Well, maybe you could agree with me that this method grade could be a good place. Now, what can I do? Well, 
maybe, just maybe, here, or here, or here, in some point, well, I need to do grade equal to something, right? Because I am not using the variable grade. So what I need to do is to store in grade the grade for my student. And what I do to calculate the grade. And you have the idea in the chat, and I fully agree with that. Something that I can do with the grade, uh, option number one, the easy one, here in this line, grade plus plus. Which one is the initial value for grade? Which is the value of grade right now in the program that I did? Hopefully you agree with me that it's zero just because I never use the variable. I never make the variable equal to something, but it's a double, the initial value should be 0, 0.0. Now, what happens if I add this line, grade plus plus, only when the user answer correctly the question? What I am doing basically is, grade is going to increase every time that my user answer correctly one question. So your grade is one, two, three, four, five. It could be zero to 10. If my user assume that I asked 10 questions and then in some point I told you, you received 10 or nine or eight or zero, whatever. Well, we can assume that this, that number over 10. But what happened if he or she select quit. Well, it's not a grade over 10, right? For that, the option that you have in the chat is great. It's like, okay, we can add another variable. And that other variable maybe is going to be a counter of how many questions I have answered. And hopefully you agree with me, just thinking about it, like you're going to have this variable that is going to count how many question you have asked, maybe that one could be counter, maybe could be integer, maybe could be global, because you're going to use that variable in the main, but also in great answer. In the main, you can increase the variable every time that you go inside of the loop. In great, you can use that variable to do some kind of division, because now you have this number, that is how many points you have, and now you have this counter about how many questions. So with those two numbers, you can calculate the percentage of uh, zero to 100 grade for the student room in the program. So multiple methods, loops, conditions, global, local variables. If you are following me, telling you what to do to improve this program, if you're able to read this program and everything is clear, we're good at this point. 50% of the class, 50% of this, uh, the content that we need to cover, done. Makes sense. Any questions so far? Yes, you can create several new variables. Moreover, you can create more methods. I mean, I create three, but there is no limit. My recommendation, guys, number one, creativity. Number two, remember, it's a good idea to make your program easy to read for other human beings. So use paragraphs, use tabs, use white spaces, use the same ideas that I apply to try that you follow my programs. The idea is that you, even though maybe you are not teaching your program, but make sure that other human being reading your program is able to understand, just because is the probability is very high that you are, be, you are going to be working in programming something, not alone, but working in a team. So keep readability as one of your priorities. Good, so moving forward. Basically, uh, 
I'm going to do that. While the equal ignore case, that is, uh, you can replace all of this with something like if the variable is and word string dot, and instead of equal and all the conditions that I put there, you can just call uh, equals uh, ignore case. You notice the name is too big. And because it's going to be ignoring the case, I can put here whatever, all uppercase or all lowercase, whatever, it's going to ignore them, right? And that's it. It's the only thing that I need. So instead of those three, I use one. Now, an additional comment. I put this angular string equal, and I put this equal equal true, right? But if you remove the equal equal true, this work because well, if this part is true, equal equal true is true, so the final result is true. You can use this part only the equal method as the final result. You do not need to compare with the equal equal true, so you can remove that one from here, and also you could ignore here, or you can put here the same idea equal equal true using this other method. Both options work. Yeah, uh, in practice, I mean, in the real world, I will use this one, uh, obviously. Right now, for teaching, this one, because I want you to remember the or, because it's in your exam. That is the only reason because I am using this option with the or. Good? But this one is kind of the one that you should use in real life. But for your exam, do not forget to practice and or and not. I need you to remember those. Good. So I need you to have in your mind that right now a program is something like the following. You have a class. You have diverse method, paragraphs. I am using here this. Uh, color, uh, white color, the class, three paragraphs. You'd like to map in what I showed you before. And I need you to think about what is happening in the computer. One, always, always, always the computer start reading your program there. The computer start reading in the first line inside of the main. We already talked about it. Second, the only instructions that the computer is going to execute is whatever you have in the main. If one of your instructions in the main is call a method, that call basically means jump to the method, do whatever is inside of the method, and come back. Moreover, you can have loops inside of the methods. You can have a loop here in the main, and that basically means that you're going to be doing something several times there. But you can also have loops in other methods. I mean, the loops are not only for the main, they can be in any method. Moreover, you can have conditions And a condition in particular can avoid a particular line to be executed. So all these lines that I am drawing here is just for you to notice what make a program complex. Because it's not only about reading top down like you read a book. It's jumping, 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 jumping. Call a method is jumping. A loop is jump, jump, jump. And even a condition is, okay, I am going to jump to avoid executing a particular line. That complexity is something that I need you to be sure that is clear. 
Moreover, it's something that I recommend you to practice, to create programs, several methods, conditions, loops. That is maybe the main part, 75% of your next exam, understanding all these things. Can I call the main method? It's an error. If you try to call the main, uh, the computer is going to complain. However, you can call. A method can call itself. And that is something that we're going to review and it's going to be very, very interesting. Think about this public, static, void, right? And my method M, you can call here M. The method can call itself. This example, you like that, is an infinite loop. It's another way to make an infinite loop. Yeah, it's going to become infinite. Think about it, it's like, do something, call myself again and again and again and again, it's a loop. You can try, you can, your program is going to be there forever. You're going to need to kill the program. We're going to review this. These have a particular number, a particular name, and we're going to talk about this. Recursive methods, uh, week seven. Kind of the continue, but remember the continue is, the result is the same as having a continue without condition inside of a loop. It's an infinite loop. The problem here is that my loop involve all the method. The result is the same. This is going to be useful for particular purposes, but what? A method can call itself. Obviously, a method can call other method. Uh, I can call here a method n, and I need to define here the method n. So any method can call any method, not only the main. Uh, the method can call itself, but main cannot call main. Any other method cannot call main. Main is kind of this very particular guy, and I am going to talk more about main in the next slides. Good, so this is later. Now, this is a program until now. We need to move to the next level. I will do my best to uh, make recursion clear. Week seven, promise. Six or seven. Now, level up. This thing, level one, it should be clear. Loops, conditions, calling method, easy. Level two, what can I do in a level two? I mean, think about it. If this is a game, and I already show you several methods, loops, and conditions, there is one thing that I need to add here, and it's going to be my second level of complexity, and yes, you have the correct answer. It's like, so far, your programs, these guys, only one class, only one class. Everything that you have done in the last four weeks is only one class. Level two, let's use more than one class. And let me be clear, each class can have several methods. Each method can have if, whilst, any loop, and any instruction. So everything that you know right now is going to be there. But now, not only in one, but in multiple classes. That is my next level, clear. So, 
how hard it can be. Let's see. Right now, you have one class. You have like this method and this method. And always, 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 you need a main. We agree on that. The thing that we review so far is that these arrows show you what could happen in that class. Again, you always, always, always start here and you always, always, always ends here. First line of the main is the first one to run. Last line in the main is the last one to run, but in the middle, the main can go to another method and in some point, obviously, it's going to come back. And maybe that other method in some point can go to another one. Obviously, in some point, you're going to return, right? But you can have loops here. Uh, also, you can have loops here or whatever place you want. Or you can have these conditions that avoid the execution of one particular line. This is one program. Uh, what if I add more classes? Adding more classes. A class is a file. The only thing that I am asking you is one file, two files, three files, four. You know how to work with one. Adding more, the only new thing is you need to search in your developer environment and hopefully you are able to find something like right click, add new class. Literally, any environment that you're using should have something like that. Or maybe in the menu file, add new class to your project or use add new file, whatever. You should have some kind of option for that. You add a new file and as usual, that new file is going to be a class. Yes, public class is going to have a name. Obviously, if I have four files, they need to have four different names, right? I mean, they should have some way to be unique. And what makes them unique is the name of the class that is the same name of the file. My only requirement is how many mains can we have? We talk about this in the week one and hopefully you remember, only one main per program. So if I ask you to create several classes, something that I need you to remember is the main is going to be in one of those classes. In which one? I don't care. The computer don't care. You can have four classes. One have the main. That's it. And what are you going to have in the others? Methods. Paragraphs. How many? The number that you want. You can have one, two, three, twenty, one hundred. What is the recommendation? You think about writing a paper. How many paragraphs you put in a document? Usually, the recommendation for uh, developers. When you create a method, keep the lines inside of the method around 50, because it's basically what you can print in one page. How many methods? As many methods as you want, but again, keep the size of your file, something that you can print and read, 20 pages. So your class, 20 pages, your methods, 50 lines, but obviously those numbers are not mandatory. I am just telling you numbers that the people handle. In general, usually think about you're going to print that code. If you need to print that in some point, keep the class, keep the methods easy to read when they are on paper. Anyway, what are we going to do to connect the classes? Because right now, as I mentioned before, my program is going to start here in the main, and my program is going to end here in the main. What I do to connect my class, the one that have the main, with other classes that do not have a main? 
is something that you already did, right? I mean, if you remember, you already have this mat that is a class, and you are already using things like Po that is in math. Uh -huh. What do we do? Call the methods. Calling the method. This main calling a method that is here is exactly the same that maybe this main calling a method that is in a different class. You call the methods and the computer don't care if they are in the same file or in different files. Uh, what do you do? Well, sometimes you need to import. Do you remember the libraries? You do not import math. You do not need an import to use math. Why? Because they, there are classes that are always available that you do not need to import. For instance, math is always available because it's part of the library lang, remember? And that library is always with you in your programs. You do not need to import Java lang. You need to import Java swing when you want to use the input dialog, remember? Good news. You can call a method in any class that you create, any class that is part of your program, and you do not need to import your own files. Your own files are always available, just like math. Makes sense. Some of you know other languages like C, C++. In that language, C and C++, you need to import, include your own files. Java, think different. It's like if you are creating the files by default, you have it. Do not make sense to import your own files. Two different perspectives. So classes, methods, using several classes, several methods. I have another problem, a big problem. And this is the reason because we're going to start using several files. Think about this. Uh, what happened if I ask you to do a class And that class is a game. And this game, think about any game that you want, but usually in the game you have enemies, right? There is something that you need to shoot or something that you need to capture or whatever. Uh, for that something, maybe we need to know some data like the speed or the position. Now you can think like, well, uh, maybe I need the speed of something and the position of something, whatever. And well, they are variables. What happened if you have in your game two of this something, two enemies. Okay, I need another two variables. Okay, what happened if you have 100 of this something? Uh, I need 200 variables. Okay, 200 variables, that could be a very bad idea. As you show you the quiz, right? 
my class quiz that is arithmetic questions. Uh, in that one, I show you a variable grade. Double. Think about the problem that we you solve. I can store the grade. The grade for the student that is taking the quiz. One student. Uh, think about Canvas. How many people can take the quiz? How many grades I need to store? Well, at least one for each of you. How many students do I have? Uh, 100. So in my program, I need 100 variables, great. Uh, no. I am talking about scenarios in which if you think in your programs, how many of these guys you have in a game? Which are the variables that you need for each of them? Speed, position, is alive, whatever. How many of these things here? Or even how many people that is working with you, playing with you, your team, whatever. Imagine any kind of graphics software. You can be thinking about the graphics, and the graphics are important, but the background of those graphics loops, conditions, classes, and methods. It doesn't matter that you're thinking about this kind of software or something more trivial, like, you know what? I have this Excel table and used like that. I have your names and for each of you, I have the grades of your labs, more than 10 labs, your assignments and your exams. And I have the same information for each of you. How many variables? If I have 10 labs and 100 students, I am talking about 1,000 variables to store that information only for the labs. And the number of variables is basically every single cell, every single box in the table. Right? That is my next level. Yes, we're going to use multiple classes. You already did that with math. The problem that I want to solve now in my new level is what happened when I already solved a problem like the grades for one student or having this guy flying and knowing it's alive or not, but I need several of the same thing in one program. Several quizzes in one canvas. Several grades in one table. Grades or whatever information I have from my students. Or in a game, I want to create several of this, or I want to have several options for this. Several options of the same. I can do 100 variables, like I mentioned before. It's not a good idea. It's an easy solution. Uh, it's not elegant. What is the solution here? Let me introduce one new concept. Object. In programming, anything, anything is an object. Anything, this drone here is an object. This row here with the information of one student is an object. Uh, the drone here in the player is an object. Uh, the exam that the user is going to solve, the quiz that I mentioned before, is an object. Anything that you need in a program, 
an object. The chat that we have here in the Zoom is an object. The screen in which you are seeing my face is an object. The chair space in which I am showing my slides is an object. It's just a common term to define everything, whatever you want. Oh, okay. The important thing is the following. Objects are connected with classes, our files, remember? Let me explain you this. What if in a game I need these guys and the only thing that I need to do is to create a class drone? In that class, I explain the computer what is a drone, the variables, and what methods a drone has fly. And then I can tell the computer, computer, I need 20 drones. The class become like a template. I only explain the computer one time. And then I can ask the computer to create several things, objects, following the template, the program that I define using one class, one file. So are you telling me that a game is basically one class for everything that I saw in the game? Yes. So if you have Excel, what are you telling me is the Excel, this one is one row per student. So what you have is one class student. And then you ask the computer to create 100 or 80 or 70 or 50 of those. And basically it's copy paste one row and create several that are the same. Yep. Classes, programs, templates. I can use one class, not one, but several times. And that is going to be very, very useful. Okay, theoretically, uh, like makes sense. Can you show me an example? Yeah. One thing in a program, everything is an object. Everything comes from a class, except one thing, main. There is only one main. Main is special. Main is going to be in its own class. And main, as we reviewed before, is the one that is going to be controlling the objects. Think about this. You are doing a performance, and the main is the director, and the main is the one that is going to tell every single actor, object, one, what to do and when. A very simple example, one main director, and I want two objects. Remember, object, thing, whatever. I am using these uh, guys, but this can be the drone, and this can be one row in my Excel, whatever. Main is going to be in one class, is a method, is going to be the director, and that main is going to use other classes to create copies, objects, things. It could be only one, or it can create several that are from the same template. Several drones, several students, several whatever you want. I am going to show you how to do one, and then we can follow the same process to create 100, or whatever you need. 
This is the picture, the source code. This is the first program in which you have two classes. And I am sure that you can read things and it like public class, my program. My program have my method main, just like before, nothing changed. Main is in one class and is one method, very simple. We're going to talk about constructors, yes, later. Main, nothing happened. Now, for the first time, I am creating another class. And I am going to use my example with the students. We can do the drones later. But I student. I student. What is the template for a student? What is the information that I want to store for a student? Uh, think about this like the columns in my Excel. For a student, I am going to start with only two columns, but we can add more. For a student, I'm going to start with the name that is a string, and I am going to start with the final rate that is an integer. And you can think about lab one, lab two, lab three, lab 10, assignment one, assignment three, whatever you need, your columns. And also, I can create methods and those methods are the things that the student can do. Uh, I am playing with this and my student can say hello, my student can draw something, methods, whatever. Did you notice something very, 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 very important in my class, student? Something is missing. Static. Why did you remove the static? Now I can tell you. If you are doing a program and your program is going to have only one copy of the information, like all the programs that we have done, only one copy. Like in the previous example that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture, only one grade, only one answer from the user, only one. You need the work static. The meaning of static is only one of this. Public static int great. Great is integer is public and the static only one copy of this box. Only one static. When I remove the static from a student, what I am telling the computer is computer this is the template. This is what a student has, the columns. But I am going to use this class, not for one, for many of them. And all of them, each of them, is going to have these variables. So I am going to do this guy, a student, and the name for this student can be John. And his final grade could be 100. But then I can create another one with a different name and a different grade. This is a final grade. This is a final grade. This is a name. This is a name. But just think about the same column, but in different rows. There is no only one final grade. There is no only one name. There are several. How many? As many as I want. Because I remove the static. I am not limiting the computer to create copies of whatever I put inside of the class. Moreover, I do the same with the variables and with the method. I can ask this guy to say hello, and I can ask this one to draw something. Two different objects. Think about these drones 
in the video game. One can be doing something here and the other can be doing something different here. One can be alive, the other may be, they are different. They are not static. Main is going to be static because always, always, always only one main. The static work for the main never is going to be removed from the main. But for the others, we're going to delete it. Now, just to complete the example, what I need to do to create a clone, an object using a class. Again, the class is the template. What do I need to do to use this template to create something that follow that? This is what I need to do. Mm, what? Name for the object, name for the variable. What do you put before the name of the variable? The type. What is going to be the type here? What do I want? My student. Did you notice the upper case? Is the name of the class. It's a variable, but it's a variable that is going to be a variable, not only with one space to store something. It's going to be a variable that is going to have several things inside. Which ones? Whatever I define here. A name, and then the equal, and a new thing. This is an instruction the instructions that we use to create a clone, an object, following a template that we define in a class, in a file. New. New what? Well, if the variable is a student, the new thing is a student. And the only thing that I need you to notice is the open closing parentheses. We're going to talk more about the parentheses, but you need the parentheses. And in that point, I have this object clone with this name. And the name of the object dot the variable or the name of the object dot a particular method, say hello. When you have math, you use the name of the class, math. Now that we're playing with something that is not static, we're playing with objects, you use the name of the object and then variables or methods. Don't worry, we're going to talk about con constructors. But for the chat, you always have a constructor. For the default in Java, you always have a default constructor. The default constructor is empty. So even if it's not there, you always have one. We're going to review that. So are you telling me that this has a connection between these two programs. Here you create this main, basically magically create this one student and put information in the name and then order that to run this method. Uh, so far you can do this with the static. There is nothing wonderful here. Well, Check the source code. 
how many objects I have in this program? How many rows in the table do I have with the same information? Did you notice that I have one name here and another name here? One is going to delete the other or there are two different spaces? Say hello, say hello for John, for Jane. Think about them like two different rows in a table. Each row have a particular value. Uh, this program has one file, the main. In the main, I am creating two objects. Those objects have inside We're going to represent object with circles. This object have a variable name, and this object have a variable grade. And the same for this object. And this circle is John, just because I decide to put that name there. And this circle is Jane. When you ask for John dot name, whatever is here is what you are using. If you ask for Jane dot name, it's like the number of the column and the number of the row. This is the information that you are using. You have four variables in this example. Four, even though if you read the program, the only thing that I have is in a student, two variables. But what I did is to use this class, this file, this template with two variables to create two clones, two objects, two entities from the file, from the class, student. So I have two entities. Each of those entities has a name and a final grade. If I create 100, I do not need to define 100, 200 variables. I can define 100 students and all of them are going to have whatever variables I define here. Moreover, check this method here in a student. I have this method that the only thing that do is to print things. Hello everyone, I am, and the method is going to print the name. When I call that method, say hello, say hello, and I call the method using John, or I call the method using Jane, I need you to notice the different results that you get. It's the same method, but one is going to use the values for this object and the other is going to use the values for this object. Two different things, two copies that use the same class, the same template, but have its own personality, its own values. And again, think about the example with the video game. Think about having this video game with the enemies. They are the same. They can be drones or zombies or whatever you want. And you can have one, two, three, one hundred, each of them with a particular behavior in a particular position with a particular 
group of features, but same variables and same methods use different values, like my two students in this particular example with different names, different grades, and when I run a method, each of them work with its own values. And the only thing that I need to do is using the new and remove the static. New and goodbye to static. Those are the two things that I show you now. And we're going to continue with this tomorrow. So far, object classes, goodbye static, and the new. Please do me a favor, open the slides, play with this code. Just make sure that you can copy two files in your environment and run this. And why not? Help me to create another student here. You have to create three and we continue tomorrow. Good? Okay guys, see you tomorrow. Thank you.